Welcome to Wager Talk TV. I am Kelly Stewart, joined today by Steve Merrill. We're talking top three tips to winning, not only long term, but in a couple of different sports. Steve Merrill, welcome in. It's so much more than picking winners. Give me your top three tips to winning long term. Yeah, Kelly, I'm going to tell you the three most important aspects to being a long term winning sports investor or better, whatever term you want to use. And picking winners is not even one of the top three. I'll make it number four. That'll be my sleeper alert bonus pick at the end will be picking winners more winners than losers but look seriously it's not the most important factor it's not even one of the top three and the most important factor and it's not even debatable and i'm going to be an extreme reason why the number one factor is money management and let's take a real extreme example to show why let's say you go 99 percent winners you go 99 and one against the point spread you bet 100 percent of your bankroll every time you still go broke that one loss is going to break you and you won't be alive to get all the other 99 winners I know that's an extreme example, but it shows why money management trumps everything else. You also could double and triple up after a loss and catch the one winner and go one and three and still make money. I would not do that. Google Martindale. You will find out why that is a terrible betting strategy. But seriously, money management is the key to winning long term. And it doesn't have to be difficult. Kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Flat bet. Same amount on every single game. That's the way I do it at wagertalk.com. That's the way I've done it for the past 30 years as a full-time professional. That's how I recommend my clients do it. And we take it a little bit further. We use a percentage of bankroll. I recommend maybe 3 to 4% on an average play. Now, I'm a low-volume guy. I average two to three best bets a night for my clients. Selectivity works for me. So I have no problem recommending 4% plays on a nightly basis. But you still have to be careful. If it's a big Saturday in college football or college basketball or it's the NFL Super Bowl with all the props, I would still not overextend your bankroll beyond maybe, say, 20% in one day. So at most, I usually have maybe five plays on a Saturday in college football or basketball, and that gets us up to that 20% risk tolerance. And look, I don't expect to go 0-5. It rarely happens, but it occasionally does happen. We have a lot more 5-0 and o days, by the way. But you have to have that downside risk in sight. So money management is the key, and that was what separates winners from losers long-term. I am the same as you, Mr. Merrill. I prefer to flat bet as well. It is just a lot better for me. Every once in a while, I like a play more than others, but for the most part, 3% is the name of the game. Next up, and this is a topic that we say all the time. You got to shop around, but more importantly, where should you be shopping? Yeah, Kelly, I want to say I've been doing this a long time, but I've been doing it for almost 30 years, as I mentioned. And when I started in the 90s, I did a money management article. When I first was on the internet, late 90s, after I'd been in business for a few years, finally had a website. It was a money management article. It also it, it appeared in numerous sports betting guides back in the 90s. Uh, young kids watching this might not even know what a magazine or a betting guide was, but it was also in print. And I put that it was very important to shop for lines. And I said, it's amazing to me that people will shop around to get a better price on a bicycle or a VCR. I've had to update that article since the 90s. But it's, seriously, I mean, if you go to the store, even the grocery store, people shop around for like a 50 cent difference on milk, but they won't even shop around for a better line when they have hundreds, if not thousands of dollars bet on a game. And those half points normally don't matter. Maybe only 4% of the time do they matter. 96% of the time, it's not gonna matter if you get that extra half point, but it adds up. Even if you're playing only two to three games a day, that's hundreds of games over the course of the year, thousands over a couple of years, those half points matter. And every time you get a push instead of a win or a loss instead of a push makes a tremendous difference. And it goes back to what I said at the beginning. Picking winners is not the most important thing. In fact, I could flip a coin, and if I could get an extra half point to a point on every selection every day, I would hit 54 55% of the blind just by flipping a coin. So once again, shopping for lines is so important. And you want to have a different type of sports book. You don't want to have the same... Having five sports books is great, but if they all have the same number 99% of the time, it defeats the purpose. You want some sharps, you want some square books. And what I mean by that, you want books that get more public action. Maybe the favorites are jacked up higher. You want sharper books in which the underdogs are a little lower. So you can shop around and get a different number whenever possible. And speaking of more books, you also get more sign-up bonuses. Now, the bonuses in the U.S. aren't what they were a couple of years ago. Um, they've really cut down because a lot of these states aren't allowing the books to write off the bonuses, uh, tax reasons, et cetera. But you can still get several hundred dollars when you sign up. So why have one account? Get five accounts. Get a couple thousand dollars in your bankroll instantly by having the ability to shop around and win more games. Steve, you brought up an article you wrote. I wrote an article in uh, 2013 in the New York Times about the rise of sports gambling and where men and women are a little different. And that comes from an emotional side. I know that sounds weird to say, 
but women do not chase as much as men. Women do not get as mad as men when they lose. I might be the lone exception there, but all jokes aside, let's talk about controlling your emotions when it comes to sports gambling. Yeah, and by the way, Kelly, happy National Women's Month or whatever the hell it is here in March. So I just wanted to throw that out to you. But no, it's an Thanks, excellent Steve. point. And I do a lot of analogies, as you know, between the financial markets and the sports betting market. And probably we should do another video of that down the road. We will do another video on that because that's a whole separate topic. But there's been studies that women do much better in the financial markets than men because they don't overtrade. Uh, they don't chase losses, like you're saying. Another study shows that some of the worst investors in the financial markets are doctors, like high skilled professionals. I always found that fascinating. One of the reasons is because they think they know everything and they are pretty damn smart, but sometimes you're too damn smart for yourself, right? A little bit of knowledge is very dangerous. And I think that's another reason a lot of people that are sports fans do not make good sports betters. But yeah, emotional control, just lifestyle choice in general is so important. And the, some of the best clients I've had over the past 30 years have been women because they treat this as a serious investment. They don't live and die by every possession, by every box score. They don't even watch a lot of the games. And I highly recommend considering that. And I've talked a lot about that on Wager Talk TV the last couple of years. I watch less games live now than I ever have over the past 30 years. And it sure has not hurt my results. In fact, my numbers have been better than ever since I joined Wager Talk three years ago, number one in several categories, multiple sports. The selectivity works for me and taking a forest from the trees perspective works for me as well. And first of all, let's put this in perspective. It is impossible to watch all 362 college basketball teams. We're gonna talk about how to win in college basketball betting here in a little bit. It's impossible to do that. So you need to have some kind of system where you can recap the games efficiently. I can recap a game within five minutes, read the recap, look at the box score, dig into the numbers, and I don't need to waste two hours watching that game on TV. And also, I don't enjoy the emotional roller coaster. With that said, I think more people than not, 70 to 80% of sports bettors probably bet just because they want the emotional rush. Uh, that's why people gamble in general. So you have to be honest with yourself. Are you treating this as an investment or as a form of recreation? Both are perfectly fine. I have no problem with either one of them, but just be honest with yourself. If it's recreation, you want to watch the games, get some enjoyment, maybe lose a little over the course of the season, that's perfectly fine. This is a form of investment for me, and I hope my clients have the same outlook. Um, but once again, balance in life is very important and it's very important as well when it comes to sports betting. Uh, Steve, you just nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. Having a work-life balance is important and having a sports-life balance is also yeah. important. Last night, saw that Michigan State wasn't going to cover, didn't even stay up for the Iowa State game, just turned it off and went to bed. Now, be it I woke up at 3 a.m. and had to check the score because my brain was not going to allow me to not do that. But sometimes it's better not to watch because I would have went to bed very mad at both of those teams. Steve, you want to join on with him? He's one of the best, as he just mentioned, top in almost every single category at Wager Talk. Right now you can get 25% off one of his daily packages or an all access pass up to one full year using coupon code TIPS25. That is TIPS25, one per user. So make sure you use it wisely. Steve Merrill, how do you handicap college basketball? I need your top three winning strategies. So funny, you know, Kelly, in November and December, everyone is a college football expert and NFL expert. No one even looks at college hoops. And then when March comes around, late February, early March, Everybody loves college basketball. Nobody cares about baseball, spring training. Baseball will take the forefront this summer, and then football's back. But college basketball tournament action, March Madness is second only to the Super Bowl. And the fact that it's spread out over several weeks, you could maybe say it is the biggest betting event of the year, even bigger than the Super Bowl. And it is a fun time of year. But the real bread and butter, the money-making opportunities in college hoops is November through March, all five months. And you do have to treat the first part of the season a little bit different than the second part of the season. However, one thing I always look at when I make a short list, and I talked about this earlier, there's 362 Division I teams. When I started 30 years ago, there were not even over-unders on college basketball games, not even college football games, just a couple of the national TV games. There was a handful of teams on the added board. Half the teams didn't have point spreads. Now everybody has point spreads, and there's not only an added board, there's an extra board on the added board. My point is you have to have some kind of systematic approach to handicapping 362 teams. And the first thing that I do is I make a short list and the number one factor I'm looking for is pace of play. And what I mean by that, some teams play half-court slowdown basketball. UVA, Virginia is an extreme example of that. Everybody knows how Virginia's played under Tony Bennett. But there's also teams that like to run and gun, like North Carolina, Kansas, Gonzaga, the athletic big boys. 
when a slow team is facing a fast team, that always makes my short list. And I'm always, almost always looking for a reason to play the slow half court team. And you can simply look at the Ken Palm rankings. They have a good uh, pace of tempo, adjusted tempo ranking. I go a little bit deeper than that. I got some proprietary models, but I talk a lot about the Ken Palms on the shows because it's widely available to everybody out there for free. And pace of play is important. Home court dictates tempo. I like to play teams on their home court. They can usually dictate their preferred pace. So if it's a faster team, they can speed up people, the energy of the crowd. If it's a slow down half court team, they're going to maybe frustrate that road team that likes to play fast. And also look at recent opponents. If a team's been playing a lot of fast opponents and now have to play a UVA slowdown team, that's even more difficult. It's kind of like the triple option in football, right? Teams don't see that a lot. Same thing when handicapping basketball. Look for those slow down half court teams. Pace of play is a real key. And we don't get that in the NBA, but it's key in college basketball. Home court advantage is also key, Steve. And I'm not sure the bookmakers have caught up, at least not in the 2024 season. We'll see for the 2025 season next year. But I feel like the home court advantage is the number one thing that I look at when I'm looking to lay points with a team at home. Exactly right. And it's a good point about the odds makers not catching up, Kelly. And I think one of the reasons is because in the NBA and the NFL and the pro sports, home field and home court have been worth less than ever in the history of the NBA, the NFL. For several years now, it's been diminishing. Um, that's not the case in college sports, especially basketball. Of all the sports I handicap, home court, home field advantage means more in college hoops than any other. And there's a few reasons why. Um, first of all, the arenas are all different. You've got some old small little gyms. You've got weird sight lines. And keep in mind, it's the three point shot is more of a factor than in the history of basketball as well. And outside shooting with different sight lines, uncomfort surroundings when you're not used to the gym can be a factor. And road teams normally shoot worse than home teams. So that's one of the reasons home court matters, especially in college hoops. Also, there's the uh, the human nature of the officials. I don't think they even sub it's subconscious, but they're going to give probably more calls to the home team when the crowd is getting behind them. It just happens. And if you look at the stats there, home teams get more free throw attempts on average. With that said, though, where you can really benefit from using home court is by figuring out which teams have a strong home court and which ones don't. You know, if you look at all 362 teams on average, you'd say home court is maybe three to four points, maybe less nowadays. But there's still some arenas that are worth five, six points. There's some that are worth one point. Um, and what's interesting to me is as a William & Mary alum, well, I follow the CAA closely and I have a season ticket holder at William & Mary games. They're having a rough season once again this year. But they do much better at home, and they don't have a home court edge. There's like 50 students there. It disgusts me, by the way. But the fact is they just don't play well on the road. So sometimes being a really bad road team gives you a slight home court advantage, and it's not factored into the odds. I think the odds makers in general are just setting a three- or four-point margin, and you can find teams that are better or worse than normal at home and use that to your advantage. And also keep in mind in December, students are on holiday. They're on break during the winter exam period is over. Um, so sometimes it's a little less meaningful than it is in January, February, and I definitely like to use it later in the season. And also like quality teams, class A teams with strong home courts, maybe just one loss of the season coming off a loss or with revenge. That's when it's a really strong handicapping factor. Yeah, 2024 20, season, well, 23, 24 season. It's been really interesting. Conference USA, best home court advantage, advantage and I had – to look it up because I could have swore it was the Big 12, but maybe a little bias. I watched too many Big 12 games this year, but something to definitely look at. If you guys want to jump on board, oh, excuse me, we're gonna have to cut that out. Steve, your number three tip, give it to me. What is the third most important part of handicapping college basketball? Well, this incorporates strong home court, so it's a little bit of a crossover here, but um, it's revenge. And we talk about revenge a lot in February, especially because we get what really technically it's a second meeting. And we get this pretty much only in conference games. And back in the day, everybody would play a home and away. Everyone play equal. Nowadays, these conferences are so big, not everyone plays twice. But most teams still do. So anytime it's a second meeting, there's a revenge situation possibly because some have it, had to lose the first game. We have no ties in basketball, no ties in baseball either, luckily. But this is a situation where you don't just blindly play revenge. The team that lost, so what I'm looking for when I'm using revenge and when it's its strongest is, first of all, a strong home court. This is the team that lost on the road. Also, a Class A team, as I mentioned earlier. Class A team, strong home court with revenge always makes my short list. But then what I like to do with every second meeting is I dig into that box score. I love numbers. I love math. You all know that. But I love having actionable info from the first meeting maybe a month earlier. And what we're looking for in the box scores are misleading box scores. And what I mean by that is three-point shooting extremes, free throw extremes, pace of play, how fast was the tempo? Did one, did one team, were they able to frustrate the other team in the half-court set? 
And this eliminates a lot of second meeting revenge spots. But then every once in a while, I get one or two a day in February that qualify. Once again, I want a team in a focus spot. That usually means a strong home court, class A, maybe off a loss. But I love digging into that box score from the first meeting and trying to find misleading results. Normally, the three-point shooting discrepancy is where we start when we're looking for a misleading final. Steve, I just have one follow-up to that. What about the pundits that say it's so hard to beat a team twice? Well, I, it, it's so funny you mentioned that, Kelly, because Ralph Michaels was on Wager Talk today this week, and he had a chart on the conference tournament angles for the next few weeks and how to handicap the conference tournament. So I recommend checking out Wager Talk today. That would be the Thursday, March 7th episode with Ralph Michaels. I'm sure Ralph put it up on Cal Sports LV on Twitter. And he had the point spread record for teams that had lost twice the third meeting. And favorites do much better when they've lost the first two times. So that goes back to what I'm talking about here in the second game, Revenge, is you want a quality team that lost the first game. Because, look, sweeps happen a lot. But I asked Ralph, I go, you know, one of the things that drive me crazy this time of year when I'm doing a lot of media, TV, and radio is everyone said it's so difficult to beat a team three times in one season for the conference tournaments. Well, from a straight-up basis, 70% of the time a team wins the third straight game. 70% of the time. So, once again, this is why we don't listen to the media. We don't listen to the sports-only channels. We want to look at raw numbers and data. But what was interesting in that subset is if it's a favorite that lost the first two times, they actually have a winning record over 60% of the rematch. So it is very difficult to beat a good team two or three times in the same season, Kelly, but it is not difficult to sweep a bad team two or three times, and the numbers bear that out. Good stuff there from Steve. If you want to jump on Team Steve over at wagertalk.com, right now you can get 25% off a daily package or an all-access pass. That is three, seven, 30, 90, or 365-day packages. Tips, T-I-P-S, 25 to get on board. Steve Merrill, I need your top three winning strategies to handicap the NBA. Basketball is basketball, right? Well, for someone that's coached uh, fifth, sixth grade AAU, middle school girls, AAU, middle school as well, not all basketball is equal. And what's interesting, at the low, low levels, like sixth and seventh grade, it's all press. The teams that can press and can't handle the press get blown out of the gym. Then you go to high school and even college. You know, we see some teams still press in college, but you never see them press in the NBA. And I always accentuate this to the kids because they're just too good. They pass the ball so well. They dribble so well. You never see a team play full court press. So my point is that Handicapping the NBA is different than even handicapping college basketball. And you have to have a different mindset. I've done extremely well with both for over 30 years, consistent winners in both. And look, I talk about watching less games than ever. I hardly ever watch regular season NBA. The only reason I do is to maybe get some information on a team that's switched some players, you know, maybe a tempo or coaching philosophy change. But there again, I can get that from the recap, from the box score, from reading the local newspapers. And I found that's a more useful part of my time but the key to handicapping the NBA without a doubt during the regular season is motivation all these teams have college all-stars they're all great shooters they're all fantastic athletes but motivation is the key and this is why a lot of people struggle with the NBA and they feel like it's difficult to handicap and you know it's funny the two things that recreational betters feel are toughest to handicap are the NBA and the NFL preseason and the key to both of those is motivation the NFL preseason it's about motivation you throw the stats out the NBA I look at some stats But for more, it's about motivation. What I mean by that is like, did they just have a big win? Do they have a big game on deck? Is it a three and four nights? Is it a no rest travel spot? Load management. We're seeing that more than ever the last several seasons when key players will just sit out every other game for a a borderline injury. What's interesting about the load management, though, is that the line has been moving tremendously for several years now, three, four, five points on a star player, yet more times than not, 60% plus If you just play that team that is shorthanded without their key player, they've covered the spread. And there's a couple reasons why. First of all, the line has been vastly over-adjusted, but it's also because the other team overlooks them. And I think they have less motivation, whereas the shorthanded team has more motivation. And once again, you got college all-stars stepping up in the role of the the star player. And also you get better team play sometimes. One other angle I'll throw out that is similar to college is revenge. Uh, second meetings. I like to dig into those box scores from earlier meetings. But once again, you got to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. Make sure all the same star players run the lineup and there hasn't been a change in coaching or philosophy. But college and handicapping and NBA handicapping are pretty different. The revenge second meeting stuff is somewhat similar, but otherwise it's all about motivation, baby. You got to make sure that team's ready to play that night. You are absolutely right. College players seem to be motivated every single night where the NBA does not. Steve Merrill, number two. Your number two top strategy to win in the NBA is? Current form. And this goes a little bit with motivation, but 
What I mean by current form, as I said, you can't really look at the statistics, and I, I put a little asterisk next to that. The last five or ten games are what I'm looking at. I'm not looking at the overall seasonal statistics hardly ever, but what I like to do when I look at the season statistics to see has there been a big change in the last five or ten games. Now, some of that can be random variance. Some of it can be the fact they've played really tough teams or really weak teams, but a lot of times it's because there's been a change within the season and maybe the philosophy of the coach, sometimes a coaching change itself. We see that often spark a team in all the daily sports like hockey, baseball, basketball, they always say you can't fire the entire roster midseason. So you got to fire the coach to try to make a change or spark the players. So do pay attention to the last five or 10, but more importantly, try to find out if something has changed because I do feel the odds makers base the line still, the starting numbers on the overall season of work. And by taking a kind of a sub season within the overall season, a trees versus the forest approach, which was run the opposite of what I normally do with handicapping, as I've said earlier, you can sometimes find little nuggets and ride teams. And also, I use another financial market analogy. Don't try to catch a falling knife. That's trying to predict the bottom of the stock market or a commodity that's dropping or an individual stock. Let it bottom out first. And you'll see teams, whether it's point spreads or over-unders, going extreme runs. You know, they'll go over 10 out of 11 games. You want to ride that momentum in the short term and don't try to predict the bottom, catch that falling knife. So short-term momentum in the NBA can actually be your friend. I recommend looking at the last five to 10 games and also keep an eye on injuries. That also goes to current form. Um, once again, I talked about star players being out, but some of the secondary guys can make a big difference. Like maybe a guy at second or third on the team in assist or three point shooting doesn't get a lot of pub. That isn't reflected in the number a lot of times. And it also can lead to a team doing a lot better, or a lot worse during a five or 10 game span. But then when that guy comes back is when you find tremendous value riding a team for the next couple of weeks. So current form is very important when handicapping the NBA, not so much in college hoops. There's key players in college, but as you said, Kelly, they usually come to play every night and they don't play as many games. They only play twice a week. So current form and load management is so important in the NBA when handicapping. This is a theory, if you will. I don't know if that's actually what it is, but we see it every year during the NBA finals. People bring it up now. It used to be kind of an under the, under the radar, in my opinion, but now it's all I hear about on X. Speaking of X, at Steve Merrill, two R's, one L on X. I'm on Twitter, too, by the, the way. <laughs> yeah, same, same, Steve. Same, same. Uh, all jokes aside, the zigzag theory. Talk to me about this one. You just did some great videos with Teddy Covers, and I wish we, I'd gone first because I would have told you to piss Teddy off by telling him that the zigzag is the best handicapping strategy ever. Teddy gives you that scrawl, that patented Teddy Covers look. I get him every year this time. About, about March, you know, is April's when the NBA playoffs start. And I always tell Teddy, play the zigzag. Zigzag doesn't work anymore. And it doesn't. If you blindly play the zigzag, and first of all, for new betters out there, that just means like in a best of seven series, you're playing the opposite results. So if the home team wins game one, you play the road team to cover game two. If game one goes over, you play the under in game two. It's kind of, and, and it used to work great in the 90s. And like you said, Kelly, it was a really good strategy a while ago. Doesn't work like it used to. But what I tell Teddy, as is anything in life, it's all about balance. It's the modified zigzag. So that's my, that's my new term. I'm a patent that I'm a trademark. The modified zigzag is what works in the NBA. And what I mean by that is there are certain situations you do want to look to zig, others where you want to zag. Just like revenge in college basketball. And by the way, revenge is basically a zigzag theory. Um, you're playing the team that lost the first game. And what do we look for when we're playing revenge, whether it's college or pro basketball? We're looking for class A teams, focus spot, maybe coming off a loss, maybe an embarrassing loss in that revenge situation, maybe a strong home court. Same thing I look for in the NBA playoffs with the zigzag is I like to play class A teams off the loss, especially at home, maybe off a blowout loss in the NBA playoffs. Those are angles that continue to work well for decades. What you don't want to look for is asking the inferior team to do something for you. And we talked about this in the college basketball video. On In general, bad teams that lost the first or even the second time, they get swept. But the good teams normally don't. So once again, the zigzag works, the modified zigzag, and that's playing the better team in the right situation. The other thing I'll point out, too, as far as over-unders, I love digging into those box scores, especially in a seven-game playoff series, because from one game to the next, it amazes me how the odds makers will bump the total up two or three points or down two or three points because of a very high or low-scoring game than game before. But a lot of times it's just random variance. Teams are lights out, like 40, 50% from three-point range. What you want to look at is the pace of play because that usually stays more consistent. And the other reason the zigzag does work, especially with quality teams, is because teams make adjustments, whereas the team that won the game, 
they don't necessarily get complacent. But what if, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? If it worked for you, don't make a change. The other team makes the adjustment. And that's another reason we see some crazy turnarounds in the NBA playoffs. A team can win by 20 and then go and lose by 20 the very next game. So the zigzag does still work, but it's got to be the modified zigzag in the right spots. He is Steve Merrill. You guys can head over to wagertalk.com, wt.buzz backslash SM. You get 25% off one of his daily packages or all access pass up to one full year using coupon code TIPS25. That is TIPS25. You only get one per user, so make sure you use it wisely.